For the second lesson this week, we're going to be talking about inlets. And as I um, mentioned to you in the little teaser section about why this matters, um, enzymes have everything to do with energy. Um, for living organisms to live, um, they have to take energy from food molecules and have to transform it because that's what makes us live. Um, and in um, we can't create energy, we can only transform it from one form in another, and that's what biochemical pathways do. Enzymes are a special class of proteins um, that act as catalysts, and a catalyst is something where if you if you look at a reaction, um, for example, the reaction of breaking down sucrose into glucose and fructose, and remember we talked about the fact that glucose is what we actually need. We take fructose and we turn it into glucose too, because glucose makes us gives us ATP, which is our energy currency. But trying to break down uh, sucrose into those two molecules is actually quite hard. And so what happens is you could do it, but you would require a lot of activation energy, you know, kind of like a spark, something that's like hot or you know, hard. Or, um, and what enzymes do, um, they, um, they make this possible by lowering the activation energy. Now, the way they do it is with their shape. And when, when I'm in this, um, when I do this in class, usually what, I'll, what I do is I'll take like a, a ruler of some sort, a plastic ruler, and I, uh, I take the ruler and I say, look, look if, I, if I'm an enzyme, if my hand is part of this enzyme, um, if I put a bend on that ruler, then it's going to be a lot easier for me to break it. And that's exactly what enzymes do. Enzymes, um, they, their shape is very important. And by, by the shape that they have, they give you the ability to bring reactants closer together, um, expose sites, um, put bends on things. And this is how they work. Um, this is how they do what they do. Now, we're going to encounter a couple of enzymes, but one of the things I want to, um, took me the longest time to figure out that that's how this works, but enzyme names, usually you can recognize when something is an enzyme because it ends in ACE. Um, and the enzyme names usually tell you something about the substrate or the reaction that they perform. So alcohol dehydrogenase removes a hydrogen from alcohol. Lactase breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose. Cellulases break down cellulose into smaller uh, saccharide chains. There are lots of examples of enzymes in the human body. In the stomach, for example, proteases digest proteins. Uh, in the pancreas, in the saliva, and in the intestines, amylases break down carbohydrates. In the stomach, in the pan pancreatic juices, lipases, they hydrolyze lipids into fatty acids and glycerol. Lysozyme, um, well, lysozymes are actually the, 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 um, the structural things, um, but there, there are um, ends in there that break down things that, uh, uh, that break down bacterial cells in our through our saliva and through our tears. Um, within the cell, we have polymerases um, that polymerize, i.e. put together into a larger molecule, poly meaning many, or meaning little things. So they, they put little things together into bigger molecules. Um, and a DNA polymerase puts DNA together, and RNA polymerase puts RNA together. Um, kinases are very special. They uh, attach phosphate groups with a high energy bond. Those are very important for ATP production, which, like I said, is our um, is our energy currency. Now we also use enzymes in for different applications. Like for example, we uh, in food processing we use amylases in the production of sugar from starch uh, to make the <laughs> the high fructose corn syrup. Um, in the dairy industry, um, if you're lactose intolerant, 
you're happy with, with us being able to have use lactase to break down the lactose into glucose and galactose so your body doesn't have to do it. Um, use lipases um, in detergents to remove stains from oil uh, in, in clothing. We use proteases in contact lens cleaner to remove proteins from contact lenses to prevent eye infections. And meat tenderizer um, is a protein. Uh, it's, a, it's an enzyme. Uh, it's a proteinase. Um, and we use that to tenderize meat before we cook it. Now, I talked in the previous lecture about what proteins are. Um, they're chains of amino acids. And you've already seen this slide before. So there's 20 different amino acids that make millions and millions of different um, um, rearrangements that they make. Um, the peptide bond is what holds them together. And then when you look at enzymes, enzymes are made from proteins. Most of them are proteins. And um, there are different levels of structure um, to look at. The first level of structure um, is the proteins, which is just a chain of amino acid. It's just the polypeptide chain. But even as they're being made, um, they automatically, some of, these, some of these amino acids are slightly positively charged. Some of them are slightly negatively charged. Some of them are hydrophobic. Some of them are hydrophilic. So even as they're being made, as they're coming out of the ribosome, they're, they're, they're folding themselves into little in, into structures. Um, and so right away, um, they fold themselves into secondary structures that are based on the hydrophobic sections, the hydrophilic sections. Um, and um, one of the types of structures or two of the types of structures that they fold themselves into are called alpha helix and beta sheets. Um, so that's the secondary structure. Um, then those alpha helices and the beta sheets, they fold themselves up into a tertiary three-dimensional structure. And that tertiary structure, that's the final three-dimensional shape protein. Some proteins, not all proteins, but some proteins like hemoglobin, for example, um, consist of several polypeptide chains. So there's several proteins that have like a tertiary structure that get together um, and then form what's called a quaternary structure. And like I said, hemoglobin is one of those. The shape of proteins is crucially, crucially important because it's important for the function. So what happens is an enzyme has an active site. So you've got this three-dimensional structure of an enzyme. And an enzyme has an active site, and the substrate fits perfectly into that active site. So over here on the right, there's, a, there's an enzyme um, reaction that shows you have your, your enzyme that's sucrase. It's got an active site that the substrate sucrose fits perfectly into. It forms this enzyme substrate complex. Um, and then with the addition of water, remember we talked about the... Um, dehydration synthesis and that the, the breaking down will require the addition of water. So under the addition of water, this enzyme then, because it manages to get the, the protein, uh, the, the, the molecules just exactly where they need to be, breaks this down into glucose and fructose. Then glucose and fructose leave and the enzyme is not used up. That's a key um, function of the enzyme. Enzymes are not used up, they're tools. They're like your hammer. If you're hammering in a nail, your hammer doesn't get broken in the process. Um, now, what does get how, how you can break your proteins is by destroying that tertiary structure. And since that tertiary structure is primarily based not on um, covalent bonds or not on ionic bonds as much as it is on on small changes. It's a small little charge here, little hydrophobic there. Um, so your van der Waals interactions, those kind of, it's, it's very small things that only work together um, because the protein, because um, proteins have to kind of be, they have to be able to wiggle a little bit. Um, because there's sometimes the, the addition of a substrate changes uh, the shape of the protein just a little bit to make it work better. Um, so there has to be some movement in there. And so because of that case, 
if you change um, the tertiary structure, you can destroy the protein. Um, and you can destroy that by, for example, heating up the protein. Now, one of your prime example of a protein, and I think that the best illustration of that is um, egg white. Egg white, also called albumin, is a protein. Um, you've, you've encountered albumin in the, in the previous class, in the previous lecture as your example for a protein. Um, and when egg white comes out of, a, out of the egg, it's liquidy. Um, it's not solid. It's clear and it's liquidy. When you heat it up, um, just the white part, when you heat it up in your sunny side up egg, um, you're going to end up with this white hard thing. You cannot get that back into the egg. You cannot turn it back into something liquidy. Um, it's done. The same thing happens if you change the pH, because if you change the pH, this is my dog in the background. Um, if you change the pH of, um, of a structure, uh, of, of, a, of a compound, what you're going to do is you're going to change the pluses and the minuses. And because you change the pluses and the minuses, they won't bind the same way anymore. And that's once, once the wrong pluses and minuses get together, um, positives and negatives get together, Katie, stop, lay down. Um, then you can't, you can't get it back again. So think about the egg as your example of a denatured protein. That's what it looks like. And once a protein is denatured, you're done. It doesn't work anymore. The enzyme we're going to be using, that we're going to be using, with, uh, working with, is polyphenol oxidase. It's an enzyme that's found in potatoes and some other fruits, and it's one of the causes of the browning of fruit. Um, this particular enzyme acts on a phenolic compound in tissues and causes them to change color. Um, if the cells are intact, then the PPO and the phenolic compounds are in different compartments, um, and so they don't, they don't actually meet each other. But if there's tissue damage, then they can encounter each other and then things turn brown. The way this reaction works is you have um, a catechol, which is this phenolic, phenolic compound, and it turns um, the polyphenol oxidized enzyme, turns the catechol into benzokinone. Um, this, um, this reaction requires oxygen. Um, just to clarify who is who here, the catechol, that's considered the substrate, and the oxygen is it's, it's a substrate in a way because it's needed in the reaction. But the catechol is your substrate, um, or the catechol and the oxygen are your substrates. The catechol oxidase, that's your enzyme, and the benzoquinone, that's your product. Now, this on the right hand side is what the active 3D structure of the polyphenol oxidase um, enzyme actually looks like. And the little square part, that's the active site. So this is where the catechol fits in, and it fits in perfectly. Um, this is also where the oxygen binds. And um, the rest of the protein is only there to maintain that 3D structure. So even if, if a protein is huge, the active site may be just a little tiny part, and all the rest of it is only there to maintain that active site. So to give you a little bit more of a, or to give you just another illustration rather than the illustration of the broken down um, sucrose from earlier. So this is, this is a little illustration of the action of the polyphenol oxidase enzyme. So you've got the enzyme here, um, the polyphenol oxidase enzyme, and then you come in with catechol and oxygen, and they two together fit into, uh, into the active site. Um, when it binds, when the substrates bind to the enzyme, it forms the enzyme substrate complex. And then because of the closeness of all of these things, in, the substrate then converts this into the products. The product's benzoquinone is released, um, and the enzyme is back with its active site ready to get more product, um, yeah, ready to receive more product. So 
you actually already know this reaction. Um, when you think about the browning of fruits and vegetables, because that's exactly the reaction that we're talking about here, right? Um, and you already know how this works, and you already have used this. So when you have a potato, um, if you leave a potato out in the air, uh, after you cut it, it turns brown. Same thing with apples. They turn brown if you leave them out in the air. So think about what do we do in cooking, for example, um, to prevent the browning of fruits and vegetables. If your mama sends you off to school with some apple slices, what does she do to change, to minimize this browning? And if you want to think about this for a moment, think about the reaction that's involved, right? The reaction requires oxygen. So if you could think of something that you're doing where you're excluding the oxygen, that would be helpful, right? The reaction requires also um, that the enzyme works, right? So if, you're just, if, you, if you find a way of destroying the enzyme, um, then you can also make the reaction not happen. And that's exactly what we do when we, when we cook with, with uh, potatoes and apples. Um, when we boil the potatoes, a, a cooked potato doesn't turn brown anymore. That's because the enzyme's destroyed. Um, baked apples, they don't turn brown anymore um, because the enzyme's destroyed. Since oxygen is needed in the reaction, um, if what I do when I peel potatoes, I always drop them into water until I need them. That way I minimize the, uh, the amount of oxygen that's necessary, uh, that, that's accessible there. Um, you can wrap apples tightly with saran wrap and that's by doing that, you're trying to keep out as much oxygen as you can. And the pH thing, uh, we also do the pH. If you're changing the pH, it also denatures the protein. And by adding lemon juices to apple slices, lemon is, is acidic. So you're changing the pH, and that's going to change um, your, your apple slices. Um, and it's going to minimize the browning. Now, the next thing I want to tell you about is about um, substrate concentration and enzyme activity. So if you have a substrate and um, you're, you're trying to change the enzyme, uh, you're, you're trying to see how fast this reaction goes, if you have a little bit of substrate, like you know, we have like one catechol and we've got, and, and I, like things, I like to think of enzymes as turnstiles things that just go around and around and around and allow you to give, let a certain amount of people in a stadium or, you know, that kind of stuff. Because for me, that works as, 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 a, uh, as an exam, uh, as, a, as a visualization in my head, how enzymes work. Because that's basically what they do. They just churn over things one after the other. So if you have, for example, if you have an enzyme that can, um, catalyze things at one unit per minute. Um, if you have one catechol and two enzymes, you're only going to be able to do one thing per minute that comes onto the other side, right? So the rate of the reaction is going to be only that much um, because you don't have very much substrate. If you add more substrate, like let's say you get to two um, of the catechols, it'll double your ability to produce substrate. However, if you go to three, it's not going to change anymore because your enzymes here are the rate limiting step. So what's going to happen is if you increase the substrate concentration and you increase the rate of the reaction, it's going to go up, up to a point. And the point of saturation is when you don't have any more active sites that you can fill on the enzyme. So your enzyme can be the rate limiting step. Similarly, if you look at the enzyme concentration um, and the reaction rate, um, the enzyme concentration, if you increase the enzyme concentration, it will just, if you have one enzyme and you have lots of substrate, that's your rate. However, if you put more turnstiles up, you're going to increase the rate. The more enzyme you put in, 
the more you're going to be able to increase the rate, provided there's sufficient substrate. If you run out of substrate, we're back to that previous curve where you ran out of substrate. Um, and that's the kind of stuff we're going to be exploring in the lab part. So what you should do next is go to um, the lab handout and look through the things there um, and um, then look at the, um, the lab lecture part, the demonstration part.